Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Hazel, the worship group. Uh, thank you, Mark and the team. It's great to be here. My name's uh, Andy. Uh, I've been introduced. Uh, and it's my privilege to bring God's word to us, continuing this series uh, in Ephesians. I noticed, actually, I think it was uh, not last week, just the week before last, there was a, a government minister who got in trouble for something that they said. Of course, it's not like a government minister to do that. <laughs> but this minister verbally put down Birmingham and Blackpool. Uh, actually, it was a, a blaspheming uh, put down. And of course, we'll, we'll forgive them for that. And in fact, just before we go any further, we're, we're not taking any moral high ground here. We all make uh, mistakes. But this government minister described Birmingham and Blackpool as god awful places during this government strategy launch. And a put down is not impressed, of course, the people of Blackpool or, or Birmingham. Indeed, the MP for Birmingham said this. Saying that uh, Birmingham was god-awful, I'm not mortally offended by that. I'm used to people thinking this stuff. It's snobbery, that's the problem. There are bits of this country that are less beautiful than others. It's okay not to like everywhere. It's not okay to look down on them in a sneering kind of way. And that's certainly true, isn't it? But of course, these things happen. We live in a society where these things go on, unfortunately. It shouldn't do. But it does. It certainly shouldn't happen in a church. And I say this this morning because this has been happening in the first century church in Ephesus. Some have been looking down on others in a sneering kind of way. You see, the church in Ephesus was probably quite a large church, a large multicultural church, and a large city in modern-day Turkey made up of Jews and non-Jews, more non-Jews than Jews. Non-Jews are described in the Bible as Gentiles. And many Jews, they kind of look down in a sneering way on Gentiles. In, in fact, William Barclay, the commentator, uh, describes actually it was, a, it was a lot worse than that. He said that the Jews believed that God loved them and them alone, and this had implications. They hated non-Jews, they hated the Gentiles. As a result, it was not lawful to help a Gentile woman in childbirth, for that would be simply to bring another Gentile into the world. So too, if a Jew married a Gentile and they both died, only the funeral of the Jew would be carried out. We ought to be grateful that we live in a, a live and let society that we do. But back to this letter, though Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus and it's 30 years after Jesus' resurrection, the temple over in Jerusalem was, was operating. It didn't need to be, but it was. And, and how it operated and how it was set up was very influential across the known world, including Ephesus. And they have literally built a wall around the temple of Jerusalem, a wall, a wall causing all sorts of hostilities between Jews and non-Jews. It stopped the non-Jews from making sacrifices for forgiveness for the different sins that they would do so that they could continue on in their relationship with God. And this is the context of which the Apostle Paul writes these verses, declaring that actually Jesus has smashed down this dividing wall that has caused this separation. It's still there, physically, but his death and resurrection has smashed it down. And of course, reassuring the non-Jews that they could come to God. They could come to God in relationship with God and have a peace with God. Jesus is their peace, it says but also challenging, challenging all Jews and non-Jews together in this church to get on with one another and be reconciled with one another because God has made one people. And these verses should work in a similar way for us today. They are designed to knock down any dividing rules that we might unconsciously put up in and around this place to hinder others from coming to God. 
just as they should also challenge us, challenge any hostilities between one another that might, might just creep into our relationships with one another. Yes, these verses say to us we need to love one another and forgive one another, just as the Lord has forgiven me and he has forgiven you. And when the Bible talks about unity, the concern for it all always is the witness of the church. And so Paul's concern for the Ephesians and their witness, that this body of believers that now God, Jesus has brought them into, he is concerned about this witness, how their relationships with one another, what do people see when they see these relationships? And Jesus said, didn't he, in the, in the Gospels, he says, this is how they will know. They being the world around, the body of believers, this is how they will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So the, these verses, firstly, are about destruction. They are about the destruction of a wall. And it needed to be destroyed because the Jews on the one side were actually mocking the non-Jews on the other side of the wall, even because they haven't been circumcised which of course is a little bit below the belt, I have to say. Verses 11 say this. Therefore, remember that formerly you are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision. These Jews disparagingly mocked the uncircumcised, these Jews. For circumcision was a sign that God had given his people to mark them off as distinct from other nations, belonging to him with all sorts of privileges, involved with that. And the non-Jews in Ephesus, these Christian non-Jews in the church, they weren't party to these privileges, of course. And Paul goes on to remind them that in verse 12. Just look again. Remember, at that time you were separate from Christ and excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise without hope and without God in the world. And another privilege that the Jews had, of course, was the temple. The temple of Jerusalem that had this huge wide influence across the known world. And so here, as thank you Mark, we've got this um, picture of the temple in Jerusalem. It's built by Herod the Great and it's out on Mount Zion. And it was consecrated with an elevated platform. It had three courts on one side of the courts. Of We've got the court of the priests, the court of men, and the court of women. Maybe we've got that one underneath. Court of women, men, court of the priests, the inner sanctum, the holy of holies. And you had to go down steps to get to a wall that went around this complex. And on the other side of the wall, you have the court of the Gentiles. And this wall was five feet thick in it. And actually, amazingly, it had it in different places. It had a sign that was affixed to this wall in different places. Not trespassers will be persecuted, but actually trespasses will be executed. And we know that because in 1871 and 1935, they found uh, historically these signs um, and with these words in Greek and Latin. And all Gentiles and non-Jews could do, really, in the way the temple, temple was made on this kind of mount. All these Gentiles could do on the outside of this wall would kind of look up admiringly, and look up longly, longingly, while the Jews actually could look down upon the Gentiles, look down upon them in a sneering kind of way. Completely missing the fact that Jesus had died on the cross for all the sins of the people 30 years earlier. Missing the reality of verse 14 in our passage that his death has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. There is no need for it. No need for that wall. And also no need for the, the inner sanctum when we, uh, we look, think back to the, can we flip back? No need also for the, the holy of holies, the most holy place in the temple. The innermost part of the temple called the holy of holies where the high priest would be allowed once a year to go in and make sacrifices on behalf of God's people for the sins of the people. And they would go through this thick curtain, thank you Mark, they would go through this thick curtain to do this. But at the moment when Jesus breathed his last on the cross, the gospel records tell us that this curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. 
And from this moment in time, Paul explains a new and better way was created by which everyone, even those far away like the Gentiles, might be brought near to God. Through the curtain, so to speak, through the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 22, it puts it like this. Therefore, brothers, since we have the confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, a new and living way opened up for us through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, sincere heart and a full insurance of faith. It's not a doomed kind of effort in keeping the law or animal fact sacrifices that a person is able to draw near to God. No, Jesus' death on the cross has made it possible for all people through faith, through faith without distinction. Maybe a, a, a picture uh, could be a little bit helpful here. I was thinking of the executive lounge in that kind of airport. You know, nowadays you take a flight to go abroad and you go through uh, passport control and you go through duty, th duty free. I, I personally like to go through duty free and we try and have those sort of free samples, don't you? I go a little bit crazy in the free samples. I have to admit that. It's my, it's my sin. I might try a, a couple of sprays and then I go to, two sprays turn to three sprays and then three sprays turn to four sprays. It's a cocktail. I walk out duty free and Hazel looks at me and she smells me and goes, well, what on earth are you wearing? <laughs> We go down and then we go to the departure lounge, so you sit down, you grab a coffee, you sit down, you get ready for three quarters of an hour, just people watching the coffee. Probably not my most favourite part of the time. People watching. But next to the kind of the, the kind of normal area of the departure lounge, you've got nowadays you've got this executive lounge. Where where, where only people who, who perhaps pay a little bit extra, I certainly don't do that. We don't do that, do we? Uh, you've got these people that who pay the extra and they, of course they enjoy, no doubt with their g &T, uh, they enjoy the extras and the privilege of the executive lounge. Well, if we liken the executive lounge to, to God's presence, probably without the g &T, but if we liken the executive lounge to Josh Pre God's presence, then before Jesus coming, it's a bit like only Jews had ex access to the executive lounge, into God's presence. Non-Jews had to kind of sit in the kind of departure lounge next to all this, looking longingly into that executive lounge. I wish I was in that executive lounge. Of course, when Jesus died on the cross, then something amazing happened. It's like the tannoy. Uh, you hear this sound of the tannoy, and it's not just with, a, with flight A413 to Tenerife, which you, you can now board at gate 45, but you hear this kind of voice over the tannoy saying, everyone is allowed in the executive lounge. Free of charge. Everyone is allowed to enjoy these privileges. Those executive lounge doors, they have been opened wide, double doors. Wide open for all. And so the, the way to God's presence has been made free and easy for all through faith in Jesus. And the question it is, the question that arises for us, bringing it around for today, thank you for hanging in there for me. But the question that arises is, do we make it difficult? Do we make it difficult without realising it? Do we kind of close the door on the executive lounge again and kind of put no entry? Do we try and sort of sew up the curtain, really, of the Holy and Holies? Do we kind of build up walls around God's people to hinder people from exploring God and coming into relationship with God? Do we look at others, maybe families? Coming from afar, or getting into the coming out of the car, and walking into the car park, and walking down, walking into this building. Do we look at them and say, "Well, we don't want them coming in here. We don't like that. We don't want them with kind of how they're dressed and how they've got their hair and kind of the language that we use. We're not sure. Not sure about them. Or do we do we perhaps look at their children and uh, and maybe the, the, the disruption that might cause in our children's groups and think, "Oh, I'm not sure about them. Those children are a little bit disruptive." And we look at them and think, oh, I don't want my, my children being led astray. I'm not sure about them. Of course, do we want people to be more like Jesus? Or are we more comfortable with people being more like ourselves? Jesus has broken down the dividing wall, the barriers across the board. And he is 
rebuilding them. And let's, let's not. He is building a new people. Let, let's not rebuild those walls in self-righteousness and boasting. So we need to remember uh, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, the key verses in the book of Ephesians. We need to remember that. It's by grace we have been saved through faith. It's not from yourself, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. No one can boast. No one can look down on others in a sneering kind of way. And so the barrier, the wall that has stopped non-Jews from coming to God has been destroyed. These verses are about destruction, but it's also about something new. It's about construction. And it's the construction of a people, a people of God. One new humanity, it says, undivided from one another by their trust in Jesus. Because everyone is equal in God's eyes. And I say that, well, clearly we're different. We're all very different, aren't we? God has made us all so very uniquely and differently, but yet he loves us equally and sees us as all equal value to him through Jesus. As one writer puts it, the cross has leveled the ground. And of course it has, hasn't it? Because all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus' death has made it possible to bring anyone into God's family. In the book of Galatians chapter 3, it puts it like this. He says, you all, to Christians, he says, you are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Jesus. There is neither now no Jew or Greek or slave or free, male or female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so amazing really, isn't it, is that God's plan was not just to reconcile Jews and non-Jews to himself, but it's also to reconcile Jews and non-Jews to themselves, to create this one body, this new humanity, pointing to God's love by their relationships. It says new humanity in, in that verse. The actual verse, there, verse 15, I think it is, 15 and 16, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. That word new there, in the Greek, called kainos, and it carries with it this meaning of the original kind of masterpiece, like a, like a genuine piece of art. I haven't seen it for a while, but one of the TV series that I really enjoyed watching is Fake or Fortune. The BBC newsreader, Fiona Bruce, she comes out and news reading and she, she does this kind of art um, presentation of artwork, really, alongside Philip Mould, and they look at different pieces of art that maybe someone's bought in a jumble sale or bought down from the loft, and they're trying to discover whether it's actually a genuine masterpiece or whether it's fake. Do all sorts of tests carry out throughout the programme. And interestingly, you only find out at the very end whether it's fake or not. It's really difficult to tell whether it's fake. Well, unlike the work, the artwork in Fake or Fortune, it's really easy to tell, even to the untrained eye, if we're a bunch of fakes or not. If the body of Christ and those in the body are genuine, because we're part of a genuine masterpiece. And how you tell, really, is how we conduct our relationships with one another in this body. So, for example, hostility towards others within the Christian church are a contradiction to the work of Jesus on the cross, who put to de death such things and replaced them that makes sense with peace. So also finally look at verses 19 to 22. Paul talks about the Christians in Ephesus being fellow Christians, fellow citizens, a member of Father's household, and a brick in the temple of God, including the cornerstone, which are all corporate images, aren't they? Fellow citizens of a new people, a Father's household, that's a family. A brick a part of many bricks in the temple of God. They're all corporate images, all pictures of a wider togetherness. And we live, but we live in a, an individualistic society that says, well, I can believe what I want and I can live how I want, providing it doesn't affect you. And we can carry on this individualistic sort of attitude into the church. We say, we say well, I can live how I want as long as it doesn't affect you. But of course, it does affect one another. We are part of the same new body. 
We affect one another, 1 Corinthians says. says. 1 Corinthians says we need one another. One part of the body can't say, I don't need you. And so these verses are saying we need to have a higher opinion of, of Christian fellowship. Don't make yourself aloof from Christian fellowship. If that's you, then you are out of line from God's new humanity, the body that he has created, that is a masterpiece. And so it's why we say, it's why we say, join a home group. Join a home group and enjoy the amazing encouragement, edification that's going to take place within that home, within that home group. It's why we say, don't rush away after the service. But enjoy tea and coffee with one another. Enjoy coming alongside one another in this body of believers. Pray with one another. Because Jesus has brought us near to him, but he's also brought us near to one another. And that is a great cost to him. And it brings us to the communion table. Daphne and Lane, would you care to join me? Hazel, can you come and join me this side? It's not Jesus' plan to make us isolated and aloof. Jesus died on the cross to bring us back to God, but also died on the cross to bring us back to one another. So he is the one who went through a painful isolation. When Jesus died on the cross, he was completely alone, abandoned. You read through the Gospels, everyone starts disappearing. He is betrayed, he is denied, his disciples run away, and the picture at the very end of those chapters in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the picture is that Jesus is completely alone. He's abandoned and isolated, and he is alone. But it, amazingly, even isolated from God, that there on the cross he cries, why have you forsaken me? Because taking on our sin becomes separated and isolated from God so that we don't have to be. So that through faith and trusting in Jesus, we can come close to God, close to one another, in that new body of believers that he has created. And, and so the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you to <coughs> do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he says, this cup is a new covenant in my blood do this also in remembrance of me for whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup you proclaim the lord's death for the cup holy spirit come invade us now we are your church we need your power in us